all about the breakfast at 9 a.m. Okay, so uh, I disagree a lot with that sentiment. Uh, but it was 1999, and it was a relatively normal night, uh, or so I thought. Uh, outside of the knock of the door of the wee hours in the morning, life was good. Uh, but what was different about this knock was that uh, this knock carried a little more weight. It was a knock that carried sadness. It was a knock that carried fear. It was a knock that carried unknown. And you could tell that that knock carried a couple of heavy arms. See, this knock was followed by the news that at the right age of 29, just two years from where I am today, uh, my father was called home to heaven. Imagine the responsibilities of an eight-year-old, consoling his mothers, his brothers, and his family. Where was I to go? What was I going to do with my life? And who was going to leave me there? See, let's be realistic. As an eight-year-old, I'm not really thinking about those things, but it doesn't defeat the fact that those questions were still there. And see, at this moment, Anita Felton became a single mother of four kids under the age of nine years old. She worked 40 plus hours a week, plus overtime, just to make under $29,000 a year. You see, despite doing everything she could, all she needed was a little bit of help. Anita found out about a program called Boys Hope, Girls Hope. This is a program that was supposed to provide a, you know, a better life for a couple of boys and give them and grant them the opportunities that she could not. And while this concept seemed like a great idea, the thought of me leaving my mom at home was nauseating. She was all I had. She was my rock. My family was all I had to lean on and depended on in every situation in my life, as is, the situ as is the story of most of the scholars in here. It was my obligation, my obligation, to take care of my mother and my four little brothers. She's sacrificing everything you have at home is a sacrifice of everything you have at home for what is supposed to be a better life for you and the end is hard. See, as an adult and as adults, some of us can't even fathom the thought of giving up the comfort of our own home for the fear of the unknown. Now imagine doing it as a 12-year-old, as a 11-year-old, 10-year-old, sometimes a 9-year-old, simply because somebody took a, said, take a shot in the dark and see how it works out. You see, what's amazing about this program is the connection that me and all the scholars share. See, I grew up in the Cincinnati affiliate, and I've met with people from the New Orleans affiliate in San Francisco, and the Phoenix, and the Detroit, Pittsburgh, and Cleveland, St. Louis. And what's amazing is we all share the same story. A young lady lost her father, so did I. I didn't know that. I just walked in and found that out this morning. Grew up in a rough neighborhood. Hey, right here. See, without getting on a tangent, I just, I'm passionate about these kids and what I do because I see me and them. I see everything that I've ever had come to me, afforded to me in them. That's what drives me and that's what keeps me going. You see, we would embark on this journey not only because our mothers or our families told us to. See, I would go to this program that she suggested, that she suggested but, you know, time couldn't move quick enough for me to be able to graduate high school and get out into the workforce. You see, up the street from my house, there was a small fast food chain that I know if you were lucky enough to become a manager, you would make $50,000. There was also a couple of city jobs that I know paying 18 to $22 an hour that I couldn't wait to go do. Now, I, I encourage you, if you have been called by God to do either one of these jobs, then please, don't do it. Fulfill your purpose and your duty in this life. But if those are the only job, op job opportunities you have, simply because you know and don't have access to anything else, I would consider it a problem and I would consider it an issue. Now, if you're paying attention, you may realize that college has no place in this story. It was straight from home to the workforce. College didn't have a place. See, to most of us in this room, before we get into the program, college is unattainable, unaffordable, and unrealistic. Scholars, am I right? I think I sat in the room last night and I said, how many of y'all can afford to go to school right now if you weren't for this program and not a single scholar raised their hand? I sat on both. Because it's the truth. That was until 
Boys Over Girls Over Pacific Tour School in Cincinnati called San Diego. It's the Loyola of Cincinnati. When I got to these, when I got to San Jose, you have to understand these students. They didn't say if they were going to college specifically where. Doing nothing less than your best was the norm. And striving for excellence was not a model. It wasn't striving for excellence wasn't something they just put on a piece of paper. But it was an inherent lifestyle. It was at this place that I realized I could go do and be anything I wanted. While the school was great, and while uh, the opportunity was more than I could ever dream of, I think uh, the, the scholars will share with me at least one day out of this week, next week, or the next three weeks, I hated this program. <laughs> Couldn't stand it. <laughs> Study time for two hours a night, chores every day, community service every two weeks, no TV during the week, no cell phone at night, and no residential counselors who were not my parents trying to tell me what to do. <laughs> I live here. <laughs> I was reluctant to give into, as we all are reluctant to give into the fact that these were people who were here simply to help me succeed. They wanted nothing in return because, you know, of course I had to fight it because, you know, at that time, at this time, you know, helping me, trying to help me succeed was a crime, apparently. And, uh, you know, it's our worst interest. At least that's how we think. While I spared you many of the details in between, I'll just have you know that Tony Gagner, Duke, Charles Stokes, Rod Dunlap, Scott Ernst, Maria Bronco, and David Roar never gave up on me. These are my residential counselors that made an impact on my life that will last forever. Those, those same counselors for these young men and women are in this room today. They explained to me and helped me understand that college was realistic. And how studying two hours a day was implementing a routine that I could use to this very day to prepare. They reminded me of how doing the chore was not a mindless task, but a meaningful duty, meaningful duty, not only to my brothers, but to myself as a form of respect for a place that I laid my head. I'm glad they showed me that being active in the community was a way to give back to those who were less fortunate than I was. And to appreciate the blessing that was this program, Boy So Girls. Most importantly, they didn't give up on me because of the care. And that's what meant the most to me. Because of the commitment of these individuals and those such as program director Katrina Allen, I grew from a young boy and a true fatherless child to a young man and a limitless dream. See, I went from hating house parents to sending them pictures of my firstborn. I went from having college to be an abstract thought to graduating in just three years. See, I went from not caring about college to now applying at Harvard. You see, you must understand that within this program, my life was changed. And not just because I received an education, but because I was made a more better aspiring young man. The youth in this room today, and I encourage you to meet them, share with them your contact info, your business card, they're dreaming. Or, I'm sorry, they're breaking the moment. They're trending now and trying to become bigger and better than things that I ever thought I could be. See, I was just trying to go to college. Mark Anthony's trying to be a billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> Our board members, our program, and the executive directors wake up every day with the purpose of changing these kids' lives. See, the goal is not just to teach them math, science, English, and reading. That's not, that's pointless. The goal is to teach them how to be better people, better service to our community, better partners, and better leaders. So I heard a quote one time that says, one does not consent to find your land without first consenting to lose sight of land for a long time. One does not consent to find your land without first consenting to losing sight of land for a long time. See, I understand and aware that giving sometimes can leave us all skeptical. Where is it going? How is it being used? Is it even being used the way one said it was going to be used? Trust me, I know in my own life I face the same fear with people every day. But it's with great confidence that I say to you today that say, had somebody gave back in, gave it to this skepticism back in 2002, I would not be where I am. It will be over the course of time that we begin to see the seeds we sow begin to grow. We cannot fast forward time. It's what's going to happen in the future. And Mark Anthony, that's important. See, the generous souls that gave to the Cincinnati Affiliate during my time had no idea 
in 2002 what I was going to do in 2008. They had no idea that I'm going to graduate college in three years in 2011, and I guarantee you they had no idea that I'd be standing right here where I am today in 2017. But at the very least, I'm forever grateful for, to them for at least, at least, giving me a chance. So my name is Greg Scruggs, and in 2016, I came back and I joined the International Board of Diverse for all the boys over girls so I've been involved in this program in one way or another for more than 15 years now. It's been my calling to give back to a program that has given so much to me. Um, like me, there will be a host of other young men and women who once saw glass ceilings and with the hope and with the help of boys over girls so now have broken those barriers. They too are looking for opportunities of a lifetime. They too have aspirations to become much more than they ever thought they could be. All I'm asking of you, like so many did for me, is to at least give them a chance. I want to thank each and every one of you for being here. I want to thank all our board members for being here. I want to thank all our staff, especially our staff. I want you all to understand your importance in our lives, in my life that they made. I want to thank all of you for being here and your commitment to the program. And lastly, I want to thank anybody else in this room for it. If it's the first time, the second time, hopefully not the last, for taking time to consider changing our life, our future, and our world. Thanks a lot.